All right, come on, Tabor, get on your feet. We're going to sing for the joy of the Lord this morning. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. And we'll shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet And we shout out your praise We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves We sing to the God who always makes verse 4 it says all the earth bows down to you they sing praise to you they sing the praises of your name and in Psalm 19 verse 1 it says the heavens declare the glory of God the skies proclaim the work of his hands let's set our mind on the holiness of the Lord this morning Generations falling down to 
worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will be, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, Your name stands above them all. Let the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy.
Jesus, you are so holy. I pray that you bring us deeper revelation of how holy you are, that we would be in awe of you like creation sings your name. God, I pray that our eyes would just be fixed on you. Yeah, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you, worship team. Thank you. I'm excited for today. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, you guys are in for a treat. I've had the privilege for the last... Oh, I don't know, 24 hours, maybe a little bit less of getting to know. Uh, now, we're just, it was, it, we, I don't know, we connected right away, just seemed, it's like kindred spirits. Um, and so I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker today, Gary Steffes. Um, Gary uh, retired in 2017 after a seven-year professional hockey career at the AA and AAA levels. In 2015, uh, Gary led ECHL in goals and was chosen the all-ECHL second team. In both 2015 and 2016, he helped the Allen Americans to the victory in two consecutive championships. In 2017, uh, the Allen Americans retired his number and uh, won't be worn again by a future Americans player. Prior to his professional hockey career, uh, Gary played four seasons for the Miami University Red Hawks, where he competed in four NCAA tournaments, two Frozen Fours, and one national championship game in, 20, in 2009. Uh, Gary now invests in competitors around the world. He's the executive director of Pure Encouragement, a nonprofit Christian ministry focused on training competitors to, to, uh, for Christ to compete with excellence and make an eternal impact. Gary's got a, a profound story. Uh, it's a very powerful story, uh, but he also, he, he's got um, more than just a story. He's, he's, he loves, he's got a passion to see this generation going after the Lord with confidence and, and, and loving Jesus with all their heart. And so I'm excited to introduce to you today, Gary Steffes to come and share God's word. All right, good morning, good morning. This is going to be an awesome morning. I am so honored to be here. Uh, I have really, really enjoyed being on campus and getting to experience your community, getting to experience some of the leaders here. I absolutely love it. And it's been a huge blessing to me to be here, but to see the heart that you all have for God, uh, the athletes and the intensity that you have for your sport, incredible. And so it's a joy to be here. I pray that I could be a blessing to you and, and come and share today. As you can tell, we're going to talk about confidence today. And I'm going to tell you my story, uh, some of the experiences that I've had when it comes to confidence, and Lord willing, be able to give you hopefully some tools that you could live a confident, victorious life chasing after Jesus and impacting so many lives. Eternity is radically changed. All right, and so we're going to have a great morning. Let me invite the Lord into our time, and then I'll get to my story. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we just invite you into this time. We truly believe that when you're a part of this, Jesus, things are way better. So will you speak to our souls, and may every one of us walk out of here with something that we can apply practically to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So inside out confidence, if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can turn to these verses, Mark chapter 12, verse 30, John 15, and you can put a marker in Proverbs 4. So here we go. This is my family. I got an amazing, amazing family. I got my beautiful wife, Michelle. She's an absolute champion for Jesus. And then my two little kids, Arabella and George, love them to death. And uh, this is my crew, the Stephas crew. And like I said, today, today we're talking confidence. All right, I want to strengthen and encourage you. So you can live a confident life following and chasing Jesus and impact millions of lives for eternity. So here's my story. I grew up in Michigan, and I started playing hockey when I was four years old. Uh, this was me in the early 90s. Great style, absolutely incredible hockey. I uh, loved it with all my heart from day one. And, and I, I just fell in love with the sport. And so yesterday I had a real eye-opener. I asked the basketball team if they knew anything about hockey, and nobody, nobody knew anything. And so I know I'm coming from a different world here, but for me in Michigan, hockey was everything. And where I lived in Canada, hockey was everywhere. We had hockey rinks on every corner. I mean, there was more, there was more hockey rinks in Canada than there are Starbucks around the U.S. Like, it's just everywhere. Hockey is everywhere. And so this was my life. I lived it. 
I breathed it. Uh, it. It became everything to me. And so I started, I started playing competitively, and I ended up moving away from home when I was 16 years old. I moved to Canada. I uh, got a chance to play in Canada, and then eventually went on to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, played, uh, played in, in the Midwest. And, and then I got a full scholarship to go to Miami University and play, uh, play there. On the outside, everything looked incredible. I was playing at the top levels. I moved away from home when I was super young. Uh, they're paying basically for me to play, and I'm, and, I, and I'm blessed to be winning championships. What would happen, that I would have these minor panic attacks on the ice, and I would literally freeze, and, and I would have to, to, to figure out, lose the puck and skate back, and it was horrible. But I would have these minor panic attacks. I feared what people thought. I was wrestling with comparison traps, constantly wrapped up comparing myself to other players, to their stat line, compared to my stat line. Uh, what does this mean for my future? And, and just in that world, I would play a game, and I would just obsess about my game over and over again for hours, unable to go to sleep because I just I, I couldn't figure out what do these mistakes mean for the future, and what did the scout and the stand think and and so my world was just wrapped in this world of hockey it was my identity it defined my significance everything about it defined who I was and if I couldn't do good on the ice I was chasing everything off the ice to try to validate myself too and so I chased approval everywhere I went I was the guy in the bar chugging rum and coke trying to impress the seniors I, I was chasing girls and making bad decisions I I was dealing with stress in really unhealthy ways Right? I was addicted to pornography at this point in my life. I'm dealing with stress in really unhealthy, wrong ways. And hockey was my God. Like, I needed it. I needed to be a good hockey player. I needed the coaches to think highly of me. I needed my teammates to respect me. Like, and that was my world. And so this was, this was what was going on internally, and I couldn't fix it. I didn't know how to fix it. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you have some internal things going on. On the outside, you look great. You look like you just got everything together. You look that you come from this great family, and you got all these things that are going for you on the outside. But inwardly, you got disaster. You got struggle. You got insecurity. You got fear. You got anxiety. You got things going on that nobody knows about unless you tell them. And, and you don't know how to fix it. And this was me. And so I'm doing everything I can trying to fix this confidence problem. I'm reading every book I can think of. I'm going to sports psychologists. I'm, I'm trying to, to do the things that I can do. I'm doing affirmation statements. And all these things were falling short, and I didn't know how to fix it. I had a hopeless moment. I had a moment where I'm on the bus driving to Ohio State, and it just hits me like, man, this is going to be my life. I'm just always going to struggle in this area. And, and that was a really hard moment for me. But it was this moment that ultimately starts a series of events that leads me to my knees, and for the first time in my life, I end up crying out to God for help. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, we had an amazing family. We'd go to church on Christmas and Easter, but we didn't have a Bible that we read all the time. We didn't have Christian ethics that we talked about every day at dinner. Like, I didn't grow up in that kind of family. Hockey was everything. And, and so for me, the, to, cry, to fall on my knees and ask God for help, I had no idea about a relationship with Jesus. I, I knew Jesus had hung on a cross, but I didn't understand what that meant for me. And, and so there was a disconnect, but I believed in God. And so I get on my knees, and for the first time ever, I cry out to God for help, not so he can get me to the NHL, but so that, that I can just get help. And, and God steps into my life and ultimately leads me to this room, in Psychology Room 125 on Miami University's campus. And there's this guy named Jamie Borchick, and he's talking about Jesus, how he died on the cross, how he rose from the grave, how he, he just bore the sin of the world on his shoulders. And as his blood was shed, that blood was handed up to the Father, paying for the sin of all. And if we will confess him as Lord of our life and believe in our heart that he was raised from the dead, we can be saved. And I'll never forget the two words he said. He was talking about Ephesians chapter 2. And he said the two greatest words in the entire Bible. It's in verse 4 where it says, But God, but God rich in mercy because of the great love with which he had for us. He made us alive together with Christ. And he invited us to give our lives. And I couldn't get my hand up fast enough. I'm like, I am in. I was double hands up. Like I couldn't wait. I needed Jesus. And so it was in this room that I give my life to Christ. And the turning point happens. And what seemed impossible and what seemed hopeless and all this inner disaster that seemed like an, an absolutely impossible to overcome God starts to do something in me and starts to change me. My first game ever as a Christian athlete was in the, the Frozen Four. 
I was against Bemidji State, and this was the picture actually of the national championship game. It was my second game. It was my first time ever competing as a Christian. But the thing that happened here in this building is I went from Gary the hockey player to Gary the Christian that happens to play hockey. And hockey started to become a tool for me to impact other people's lives rather than the identity that defined my significance and who I was. And so this inner shift begins to happen. And over the course of the next 10 years, God begins to transform my life. He begins to work in me to such an extent that confidence literally becomes one of my greatest strengths. And it wasn't that I had it all together. It wasn't that I didn't struggle. I mean, I definitely had ups and downs. And every one of you that are athletes in here, you understand this. You will always battle against the changing dynamics of sport and having to fight for confidence. But God began to give me tools that I learned to win. I learned to deal with the inner stuff going on. I learned to start to process that. And confidence becomes this strength in my life. And it began to change. And so what seemed impossible became possible through the power of God. And so I ask all of you today, where is your biggest struggle with confidence today? As followers of Christ, we can wrestle a lot of different things. We can wrestle against things like this. We can wrestle insecurity. We can wrestle with the fear of failure. What if I drop it in class and I totally bomb it? And what happens? And you just wrestle with the fear of failing in school. You wrestle with the fear of, of failing. Maybe, you know, God's put you in a position of leadership and you're just so afraid of what happens if you just make a mistake and, and you just, you have that pressure on your shoulders. Maybe you fear what people think of you. Maybe you're wrapped up in comparison traps. Maybe you wrestle to share your faith with others and, and you just don't know how to engage that. And you get these spiritual moments that come across your path and you just wrestle the confidence to step into it. Maybe lies are filling your head right now, and all you can think about each day is how you are just unworthy and unloved and not valuable, and you are just so full of doubt and insecurity and lies that you are not living a victorious, confident life. You're struggling. But here's the encouragement. Confidence is possible. And if you have the thought in your head right now that it's not, let me just take that right out of you. Confidence is possible. That's a lie from the devil that if you think God can't change and bring confidence into your life, it is possible. Confidence is possible. But the way we approach it has to be from what I call the inside out. And this is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to share a little bit of my story. Uh, that, mind you, this is the things that I was learning, and I am still learning. And so even as I stand here, I'm not a guy that's up here telling you the things I've learned so you can figure it out and then just go and, and do it, and I got it all together. I'm in the fight. I'm in the battle. I'm in my journal wrestling daily. I'm on my knees getting right with God all the time because I blow it probably more than all of us here. I am constantly wrestling to fight in this confidence battle. But if there are some things that maybe I've learned from my career and my life now in ministry and doing these things last decade, if that can encourage you and give you some things that maybe will help you, I hope I can encourage you today. So this is where I come from. There's this verse in Mark 12. This is changing my life. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And I believe the order matters. If you notice, heart, soul, mind, strength, this is an inside-out endeavor. If the heart is the inner man, the very depths of who we are, and the soul represents uh, the, our will, being aligned to the Lord. So if, if, if God is leading me one way and, and, uh, and I want to go the other way, aligning my will with God is, getting, is surrendering and getting my, my will aligned with his. Right? Uh, processing emotions. I, I guess I would put that in the soul level. And I know there's theological discussion about how that goes, but for today's talk, the heart, the very inner man, the soul, the will, and the emotions... And then our mind is the way we think, and then our strength is the way we act. For much of my life, much of my life when I first came to Christ, I reversed it. And this is how I lived my, my walk with Jesus. I was chasing after him with all of my strength first. Then my mind, then my soul, then my heart. And so what does that even look like? It looked like this. For me, like loving God with all my strength, I'm going to go. I'm going to do I'm going to give, I'm going to serve, like I'm going to be a great Christian. And if I'm honest, the same intensity that I was chasing the NHL with is the same intensity that I was chasing after Jesus to be an Olympic Christian. I was going to be an Olympic Christian. 
And I was intense and I was passionate and I was going to do whatever God told me to do. I'm going to go and serve and minister. I'm going to do more. I'm going to be better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to love with all my strength. And then I'm just going to crush sections of Scripture. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to fill my head because this is what I know I should do. And so I was fighting to love God by doing more and then by reading more and getting God's Word in me. Occasionally I would get to that wrestle and take the time to wrestle about where my will is and aligning it and surrender and then processing what I'm feeling. Especially as guys, we struggle to process what we're feeling. And, and then rarely would I really take the time to dig, dig, dig in my soul to deal with the heart level stuff of selfish ambition and pride and bitterness and unforgiveness and the hurts that I'd been through in my life because it takes time. It, it, it takes dealing with the pain of my past. It takes uh, courage to go into those spaces and to really get to the depths of what's going on inside to surrender and trust the things that I'm gripped to. So this was my life with God, and the result is I ended up exhausted. I looked like this. I was constantly chasing everything on the outside. I wanted to be a great Christian, and, and this is how I also chased confidence. I, I wanted to be a great athlete, so I did more. I tried harder, I, and I, I put my life into all these uncontrollable things on the outside that I got to look the part. I got to have the reputation. I got, I got to have, as an athlete, the stats that validate me, or as a leader in the Christian world, as a guy who everybody thinks is great when he speaks and is great when uh, he leads a, a small group and people are always impacted by the things that I have to share. It was always chasing this outside thing that had to do with what other people thought in my performance. My strength drove my walk with God. And the problem was, is I ended up missing the roots. I was always missing the roots. I, I, like if you ever garden and you go to pull it, if you chop the head of the garden off, like you always, or the, the weed off, it always grows back. And those roots sometimes, if you've gardened, like you can go really deep. They go, they go far. And so to pull those roots are hard. But my sin struggles kept coming back again and again and again. And my confidence struggles kept coming back again and again and again. And especially before I knew Jesus, like dealing with things at the heart level, that wasn't even an option. I didn't even know how to begin that. So everything I did was from the outside in, the strength first effort. And because I never pulled the roots, I never found freedom. Confidence issues are never cured and solved with an outside in approach. We have to learn to become inside out. We have to learn to win in the heart first. And this is what we're going to talk about today. How do we win in the heart first? How do we win? As followers of Christ, God wants our heart. He wants our heart more than our sacrifices. He wants the very inner man. He wants us utterly and completely connected at a heart level. And for many of us, myself included, I have chased Jesus trying to do all these things that I should do. But my heart didn't really, wasn't really in, or my heart wasn't really chasing it. And I'm trying to do more, but my heart is far from it. And I had it reversed, and I had consequences that came. And so I'm learning in my life now, this victorious, confident life, it starts in the heart. And I have to take the time and be courageous and faith-filled enough to truly come to the throne of grace, as he says in Hebrews chapter 4, and lay myself at the throne of grace because when my heart is truly exposed, grace is the only thing that is going to save my life in that moment. But coming to the throne of grace and giving God my heart and learning to fight there. So how do we do this? How do we win in the heart first? For those of you that are athletes, you would agree with me that uh, when you think about a championship team, championship teams need relentless offense and they need a super strong defense. You, you, can't, have, you can't have a team that's only offense because only offense results in absolute vulnerability and you get scored on all game. But you can't have just defense and play defense all day because you end up in survival mode. And all you do is defend, 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 and you never score goals. So you have to have both. You have to have a relentless offense and a strong defense. And for me, for much of my Christian life, I've, I've taken the approach of, man, I just got to do more. And, and then with that, I got to play great defense. And I just got to defend. Like, like, don't look at this. Don't sin. Don't think that. Oh, I got to avoid these people. I, I'm just defend, defend, defend in my life. And I end up in survival mode. Maybe you relate in your pursuit of confidence or your pursuit of just chasing Jesus. And so I want to encourage us today to win in the heart. We have to be on relentless offense 
and have a strong defense. And so what does that look like? The relentless offense is this insatiable, radical pursuit of intimacy with Jesus. We're going to talk about that. And then defense is guarding our heart. It says in Proverbs 4, which we'll talk about in a second, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So we have pursuit and we have defense. Let's dive into John 15. John 15 says this in verses 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the power source. He's the vine. And as branches, it's not our job to try to go and produce fruit in our own strength. It's not our job to try harder and to do more, to make this spiritual spiritual fruit be produced in our life. It's our job to fight to abide to get intimately connected to Jesus, this, this vertical pursuit of intimacy. And so how do we even do that? We have to fight day in and day out, the second our feet hit the floor, to live with utter dependence on the vine, utter dependence. I'm learning that when I hit, my, hit the ground running every day, the first thing I want to do is get on my knees and cry out to the Lord, God, I am utterly dependent on you today utterly dependent, utterly dependent. And I have to spend time with Jesus. Like relationships deepen when we spend time together. And it's not just me reading a couple chapters of the Bible so I can get my stuff for the day and run. It's, it's time. It's unhindered, intimate time with God to where we're talking with him about what's going on in our heart. And we're making the intentional effort to process the emotions that we feel. And we're dealing with the surrender and trust issues that we have. And we're working day in and day out offensively to remain intimately connected to him. That there would be no hindrance between me and him. There would be no sin struggle, no, uh, no immorality or, or bitterness or anger or thing there that I'm carboring and holding on to that I don't want to let go of. We are fighting to remove every hindrance and get as intimately connected to Jesus vertically as we can, utterly dependent with time on him. And when we do, he promises to produce fruit in our life. The vine produces fruit. So as we remove the hindrance and we utterly depend, he begins to produce the fruit. And so this vertical pursuit results in a horizontal transformation of our life. It wasn't because I was trying harder to be more loving and more joyful and more peaceful and and more patient and more self-controlled. Like that's not, I used to look at the fruits of the Spirit and think, man, these are just things I got to try hard and work at. I'm learning these are things he produces. My fight is to get as intimately connected to him as I can. Utterly dependent, time with Jesus, intimate heart connection with no hindrance. He'll produce that stuff in my life. It's a vertical pursuit. This is our offensive attack every day. You want to win in your heart? Go on the offense. And this is your pursuit. Intimacy with Jesus. Do not let anything, not, not, not any dream you have, not any, any school thing, any, anything with relationships, anything with work. Let nothing get in the way of your pursuit of intimacy with Jesus. That is the thing. He's the power source. He's the vine. We also have to have a strong defense. The strong defense in Proverbs 4 says, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. We have many enemies that fight for space in our hearts. Many of them. They they like to lodge in our heart and then they significantly affect our confidence. They start to destroy us and give us insecurity and make us live in fear and anxiety and we start to chase things that we shouldn't chase and, and it leads us down a wrong road. If we harbor pride, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy, things like this, if we harbor these things and we let them lodge in our hearts, they are going to start to destroy our confidence and really start to impact our life in negative ways. There's a, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says this in verse 9, be, be, don't be quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Anger lodges. It takes up residence in the heart of fools. 
So the enemies of the heart, and there's many here that Jesus speaks of and, and the things we read in God's word that, that become enemies. And we have to guard against these. Like you got to be a warrior ready to go to battle every day. As your circumstances are changing and your life is going in different ways and you got relationships that are maneuvering and, and you got things that are good and things that are tough and, and you got all these different challenges that hit you and in good days and, and okay days and you're living the life that we live, you're going to have enemies that hit you. You're going to get somebody saying something that really rubs you the wrong way. You're going to get moments where you just want to be puffed up and prideful and be like, yeah, look at me. You're going to have moments when you get angry and you're going to have to deal with that and not let unforgiveness take root in your heart. We have to be warriors that defend. If we want to win in the heart, we go after offense with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus, and we start to become warriors who guard our hearts daily. It says in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and if there's any grievous way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Like what a prayer to pray every day. God, search my heart. I'm going to pause and take the time to let you search my soul. And if there's any grievous way in me, if there's any hindrance, let's get rid of it. Lead me in the way everlasting. This is the, this is the life of victorious, confident life. On my website, you can go and you can find a PDF with enemies of the heart. There's a big list of them, and it looks like this. Where, where it explains some of these enemies of the heart and some ways that we can process it. So, for instance, anger in particular. Anger often says, uh, it happens for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that when a goal is blocked, we get angry. Right? If I really want to get my homework done, but, but I keep getting interrupted by people, uh, my goal is being blocked to get angry. But another way that it happens is that when, when, when somebody wrongs us and they do something that hurts us, we feel like they owe us something. They, they owe us an apology. They owe us uh, the thing they stole. They owe us our reputation that they just destroyed. They owe us the opportunity that I'm not going to get anymore. And we can feel this debt that happens. And, and so we have to learn to recognize these things in our heart and then apply these weapons here. And this whole PDF has, has a list of these things. You can download completely free, pureencouragement.com. Go there, download this. And use these weapons to start winning in your heart against these enemies. And, and so forgiveness is the weapon that beats anger. Why is that? Because what forgiveness says is I release your debt. Forgiveness doesn't say that what the person did was okay. Forgiveness doesn't give that person permission to do it again. Forgiveness doesn't minimize it if it wasn't important. When Jesus hung on the cross and he bore our sin and he cries out, I, like, Father, forgive them, and he forgives us from the cross, he's not saying, Gary, it's okay that you keep sinning. He's not saying, Gary, your sin isn't that big a deal. He's not minimizing it. And he's not, he's not giving me permission, and he's not saying it's okay. Jesus is saying, I release your debt. You no longer owe me anything anymore. And so for us, when we get angry, releasing the debt and identifying the debt, when you become great at that, you're going to start winning in your heart and finding freedom and victory in new ways. And for some of you, it might be the other side where you wrestle with guilt, and maybe you actually need to receive the forgiveness that God gives to you, that he actually literally says, I release your debt. And today's going to be the day when you walk out of here and you're like, man, I receive it. I release your debt. So, whether it's extending it, whether it's getting it, so please go on my website, use this. This can be a weapon to guard your heart, okay? So as we wrap up today, confidence is possible. Whatever your struggle is, confidence is possible. But it starts in the heart, and it has to be done from an inside-out endeavor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. If you start winning in the heart first, your life is going to become radically different. And what do we do to win in the heart? We relentlessly pursue intimacy with Jesus. Relentlessly every day. And then we stand firm and we guard our hearts because everything we do flows from it. And I'll close with this. I'll close with this. My favorite verse in the entire Bible. I got it written on my Bible right here. A uh, dear brother of mine put it on the front of my Bible as a gift. I love this verse. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth. Another version says he searches to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might strongly support those whose heart is completely his. If your heart is his, an extraordinary God wants to do it, or we as ordinary people, an extraordinary God will do absolutely extraordinary things through us as ordinary people 
when we give our hearts completely to him. And so to close, friends, what is God saying to you today? I just, before we walk out here, before you go back to classes and to stress and to tests and to sports and to all the things, just take 30 seconds. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? I want you to write it down or turn to your neighbor and share with them, okay? And then Ryan's going to come up and close us. Thank you for having me this morning, friends.